Colloquium started. Hello and welcome to CAM Colloquium series. Um, um, before we get started, our usual announcement, uh, this talk is being recorded. Um, um, we would appreciate it if you could keep your audio muted uh, and your video on if possible. That makes it easier and more interesting for the speakers. Uh, the speaker today is Professor David Schmois, uh, uh, who works in the Department of Operations, Research and Information Engineering, uh, is a very active CAM member, also uh, leads our Center for Data Science for Enterprise and Society. And when I'm thinking of David's work, uh, uh, to me, it's always one of the prime examples of how you can you don't have to choose whether to have impact on applications or do uh, interesting uh, mathematics. Uh, you can actually do both. Um, so David's work uh, is a remarkable example of that, of doing first-class mathematics on applications uh, as diverse as uh, optimizing bike sharing platforms, uh, and sustainability applications, um, COVID modeling uh, and um, making up the schedule uh, of classes for Cornell University. So if you don't like your time slot, you know whom to blame. Um, and uh, today's talk is yet another example of this uh, topic of very, um, very, very uh, clear societal relevance and interest. So uh, thank you very much. One last announcement. Uh, is uh, that David uh, welcomes the questions as the presentation goes along. You're welcome to put it either in the chat uh, uh, window in Zoom, or you can just mute yourself and speak up if you want to ask him something. Thanks. Welcome, Great. David. Thanks, Alex, and thanks for the intro. It's always fun to talk to the CAM Colloquium. So today I'm going to talk about joint work with a, a former undergraduate student, Wes Gurney, who's able to join us and who is currently debating what graduate program he wants to attend next year. Uh, so I'll be talking to you about what we've called fair mandering, uh, a column generation heuristic for fairness optimized political redistricting. And um, as the, the map on the cover slide makes clear, um, this is really a question of how is it our once every decade approach, do we actually construct congressional districts? Um, and this is a problem that has a long history of using algorithms to create uh, fair districts. Uh, the word that often gets used along with it, that of course fairmandering is a, a play on is gerrymandering, which has a connotation that um, the way that you engineer districts to be unfair or be to your own advantage is through geography, through the sort of hand tailoring of, of filigreed district shapes that uh, allow you to sort of choose your districts as you want. And what, we're, the, what I'm going to present today is a new formulation, which the objective is going to be emphasizing fairness explicitly rather than the um, focus on the, the shapes of the districts. And in some sense, I'll, I'll give away the, the, the punchline is that one can be plenty unfair even when constrained to being relatively well-drawn compact districts. And so it's good to optimize for what you really want uh, rather than what uh, might be in many ways um, a correlated uh, consequence. So, and so we're really going to decouple the, the generation of, of potential districts from the optimization. We're gonna create an exponential ensemble of potential district maps, and we're gonna be able to efficiently optimize over that ensemble. And we're, as a result, we'll be able to optimize relative to an underlying stochastic model for expected electoral outcomes. And uh, this will allow playing with a, a number of definitions of fairness and, and actually turn it over to others to, to inject their, their own viewpoint on this as well. And so these two maps as side by side examples of North Carolina make clear that, you know, if you look at the map on the right versus the map on the left, you know, the, the map on the right goes after the sort of um, 
compactness view that they look they look like nice districts that are that are are, are formed in terms of reasonable shaped, whereas the districts on the left um, look much more along the lines of the the gerrymandered district that we all living here in Tompkins County have been victims of. Um, that uh, on the other hand, it's natural to from from reasonable me metrics of of fairness the one on the left is actually the fair um partition whereas the one on the right uh is not so let's just sort of give a sort of concrete toy example just so that we can think about the 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 issues at hand um you know in many ways gerrymandering is sort of the the art of politicians getting to pick their own voters we, we're at the critical state stage uh, just at this moment, uh, that where state legislatures will be responding to a new census every 10 years and getting to pick both state legislative and congressional legislative boundaries. And that you can do this in a variety of ways to your advantage. So for a very toy example, just to sort of lay out the groundwork, imagine this 50 precinct state um, and let's say that uh, um, the 60% uh, of the districts in this case are, these are the blue districts and these are the red districts. And if you just contrast um, two, oops, sorry, two different uh, ways to delineate it, uh, that if you look at the consequence of, of, of the first partition, well, you can see that you know the, the the blue districts in this case have positioned themselves to win district by district wide um, each of the five districts, and this is um, in you know the sort of standard language is to um, pack and crack. This 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 plan A has cracked all of the the, the red voters spread across the five districts. Um, um, on the other hand, on the other in the other arrangement, we can see that that, that the red alignment has managed to pack um, its uh, its voters exactly right, so that although it has a minority uh, control overall, it's still managing to win in in, in a majority of the districts. Um, that and, and you know some things are are legal and some things are legal illegal. Securing partisan advantage is is just fine as far as legality goes, and uh, protecting incumbents, which of course is one of the driving issues behind it, is also legal. But suppressing voting power um, of racial groups that is illegal um, until the Supreme Court takes it away. Um, that. Uh, there are a number of solutions that have been out there. HR one, uh, which was passed by the House this this week, um, has in, in mind uh, giving the drawing pa power to independent commissions. Um, and of course, one of the things that has been um, a feature of, of a long history of work in our community uh, has been that uh, well, if we somehow put hands, you know, put the decision making power in the, in the hands of an algorithm which doesn't draw on political input, um, that hopefully makes things fair. And as you're gonna see that it being blind to um, political input is not the same thing as being fair. Um, this has been sort of epitomized by the, the, the kinds of approaches in which the goal has been to optimize for compactness. So let me sort of introduce some notation I'll be using all along and frame the question um, here we have the map of Nebraska. Um, we're going to be viewing this as um, having start as an input uh, partition of the state into atomic geographic blocks. Um, we'll be using census districts as our basis, but there, th this could be at, at varying le levels of granularity. And so we'll be denoting that set of blocks for a given state by the set B. And then by the geography, there's an adjacency graph that is associated with it. Um, so that if two blocks share a common non-trivial boundary, um, then we, we can represent this by an edge in our edge set E. And those edges have Euclidean district between the centroid of one block to the next. There will be a input parameter K, which is into how many districts do we want to divide the state? 
and then there'll be a tolerance overall for how balanced the population should be. And I'll be denoting that epsilon sub p in terms of, of and that. And this is all of inputs. And this gives rise to a set of constraints on what we're looking for in terms of an, uh, an output that, well, first of all, we, the output should be a partition into K regions or K sets um, that we'll want that the regions be population balanced. So for example, uh, within 1% of uh, plus or minus of the, the mean population. We'll want that the regions be contiguous, so you can walk from any point in, in the region from in the district to another. Of course, there are a few potential exceptions depending on the state of things like uh, Hawaii uh, and, and, and let's say Michigan, where clearly contigu contiguity is not as trivial as might otherwise be. And the standard two kinds of objectives, broadly speaking, without being precise mathematically, is sort of this notion of compactness and um, some notion of fairness. And that's what we'll be talking about today. OK. So this is, from an algorithmic point of view, a very well-studied problem. Um, it has many Cornell roots to it. One of the uh, early um, optimization-flavored papers um, studying um, political districting is a paper by Garfinkel and Nemhauser in 1970. Um, it may be a little unfair to call it Cornell work, even if George was uh, on the Cornell faculty by the time that paper appears, but it was Garfinkel's thesis at Hopkins before George moved to uh, Cornell, to ORIE. Um, Nemhauser returned to that with Mirotra and Johnson while he, when he was already at Georgia Tech. Um, there was recent work by Cohen, Cohen, Adad, Klein, and Young which took very much the, the compactness view of trying to optimize districts. Um, and very recently, there's been work of a, a, a Cornell PhD grad, Sheldon Jacobson with uh, Swami and King on a multi-objective optimization framework for political districting. Um, and while optimization is gonna be the focus of the perspectives that, that, that I'll, I'll be, uh, Focusing on today, there are a number of, of alternative mathematical frameworks to, to mention in terms of other uh, quantitative analyses that can be done. There's a really elegant work of DeFore, Duchin, and Solomon uh, for, uh, that are based on a Markov chain approach to uh, um, both sampling and, and analyzing uh, potential district uh, solutions. Um, and there's right work of Hirsch blog Mattingly, Sachs, and Wise, uh, which is again from a, from a Monte Carlo sampling uh, approach. But those are just highlights of, of, of really what's a, a rich literature um, that's out there. So I'm going to be employing the tools of integer programming to, to build the, the framework that, we, that we'll be looking at. And I want to start by looking at, in many ways, the idealized integer program. And to do this, um, I want you to as it use as an example, this very simple state in which the blocks, um, there are 32 of them, uh, four nice rows of eight blocks um, in each column. Um, and one, you know, as long as we're just staring at the ceiling and, and thinking of what might be possible, we might just consider enumerating every possible district that, uh, could might be feasible as one of the, and I'll use in this example, I'll be imagining partitioning it into four districts. Um, so, you know, the, the simplest one to imagine is the, the district that I've just encoded in the upper left corner, then the lower left, and then the upper right and the lower, lower right as, as potential districts. Um, and we can encode that um, amongst all of the 32 blocks as a zero one column vector. And that's what I've indicated in the sort of yellow and purple here that, you know, you could imagine that these are the first uh, four uh, index blocks, then next come, if I'm thinking about in row major order, then these are not included. And so the yellows are indi indicating uh, in a kind of binary zero one matter of a way of encoding this particular district. And so I can imagine um, a complete enumeration of all, let's just say, again, kind of a vague way, all feasible districts. Um, each of these districts, DJ, is a subset of the set of blocks. And then, of course, I can encode 
all this complete enumeration by a matrix A, where every column corresponds to one of this enumeration. So we have N columns and every row, just as I've done here, corresponds to one of the blocks. And it's just a zero one matrix, which is one if the block is in that district and zero otherwise. And if I'm setting up a, an integer program, well, the natural thing to do is I can introduce a decision variable xj corresponding or to each block, uh, to each uh, potential district dj. Um, and this is going to be a binary decision variable to indicate whether or not I wish to include that district in my overall district plan for the whole state. And one can then set up two very natural constraints in, in terms of that. The simpler constraint is simply that I should have k districts so that if I sum up xj over all of the variables j from one up to n, that should sum to be exactly k, that I'm, I'm actually making a selection of k districts. And that uh, furthermore, for each block that I have, I should constrain that if I look at over all the columns that I've selected, that I must have selected exactly, I've, I've set to one, one of the, exactly one of the variables for which that block is contained in that district. And so the real thing of, you know, why do I say this is an idealized integer program is that there are sort of two kinds of problems implicit in, in that highlighted um, statement. One, there are an exponential number of, of such feasible districts and even just characterizing what does it mean to be a feasible district will be itself a non-trivial algorithmic question. But you know, exactly this framework is something that's very well studied in the discrete optimization literature that comes under the name of a set partitioning integer program. You know, it consists of exactly these two family of constraints um, and in many ways, what traditionally gets viewed for set partitioning integer programs is that the primary difficulty is the exponential size. Um, but nonetheless, set partitioning integer programs formulations are the backbone of the practical solution in many, many applications. Um, for example, perhaps one in which it, it, it had the, the greatest success um, is in, in airline crew scheduling. Um, that, that, that this is really the, the engine behind it. And this, the reason that this can work so well comes from in part from two reasons. One, the relationship between this problem as an integer program, when I constrain the xj's to be zero or one, and its linear program is that the linear program, when I relax that to just be between, that the xj's are bounded between zero and one, provides very strong, typically tends to provide very strong bounds. Um, but the, the, the question is, well, how do I handle those exponentially many columns? And for linear programs, the, the, the chief technology is that we can solve the linear programs by in effect generating the columns on the fly, that we can optimize with just a restricted subset of the columns in the, in, in the analogous version of what we're looking like, a, a subset of the variables of potential districts. And then linear programming duality provides a test of whether you've pre-selected the right subset. And if not, you can use the tools of LP duality to then generate, as I said, on the fly, omitted variables that you thought you could set to zero and pretend it didn't exist, but in turn generate uh, what else you need to augment the current column set. And so from the point of view of using sort of traditional methodologies, the issue and the bad news here is that we don't really have for a reasonable notion of feasible, the, me the mechanism for doing this on the fly column generation. And what we're proposing instead is an alternative where we can generate both a large enough set of columns that work together well enough together and that are expressive enough in order to give rise to um, a, a robust set of statewide plans that then allow us to optimize with respect to various parameterizations. So maybe just to drive the point home um, a bit more to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, go back to this 32 block example. Here is one complete district plan. And you know that this could correspond then to the, the following columns, which I've again highlighted the ones in, in their respective colors. 
being selected, I said that those variables are equal to one. And, uh, but in general, as I think about that full matrix A over all column enumerations, this gives rise to a, a, a set of integer points um, F, that's the feasible set of our indicator vectors uh, of, of which districts we're going to use that cover every block and that use K districts. So this is the political districting problem. Um, there's really gonna be issues on, on, on what it means in terms of the objective. There are many competing properties that we'll look at it um, over these kinds of formulations. And what we're gonna be interested in is the fact that, that as I look at the scale of the number of districts, the question is really how robust a set for a given um, set of D, what's, what are, how robust is the corresponding set of F? And so you can think about the ratio of the number of feasible district plans to the number of, of columns generated as being sort of a leveraging factor of the, of the generation, of the column generation that we've done, or maybe thinking of that on, the, on a log scale. And this, in some sense, gives rise to the, the kind of robustness that we'll be interested in, in, in measuring um, for our formulations. So maybe I'll just pause and just check that we're all on the same page. If there are any questions, uh, you know, maybe this is time there to is, jump in. There is one in the chat window. Uh, there is a question on how would you enforce district contiguity in the column vector? Good, we'll get to there. Let me put, put that one on the stack and, 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 uh, and, and, and we will do exactly that um, along the way. Okay, other questions that I'll defer? No. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is um, propose a, 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 an approach to generate districts and district plans um, which builds on a kind of uh, hierarchical decomposition of the state. And uh, I've started to depict this in a, a portion of a stochastic hierarchical de decomposition tree that you can see there for the state of North Carolina. Um, and that what we're going to do is um, at every level of depth, we're going to take the current version of a region and decompose it. And so we can think about building this tree um, where every node is going to correspond to a region and a number of districts that it must encapsulate. So initially it's the entire state and, uh, um, and, and all of the, its, its associated value of K and we'll generate what we'll call a number of root partitions. And uh, so in this case, the picture denotes uh, three partitions of, of uh, North Carolina with differing splitting factors. Um, so the, the size is going to be uh, decomposed um, in different ways. And then at each level of, of, of the tree, we're gonna make the further decompositions along the way. And so as you sort of think about the fan out in this tree, that's gonna be a, the width W, which says the number of partitions for each node. And uh, that uh, we're gonna talk about the split size Z, which is the, 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 the size of, of, of each partition. So one way to think about this is I'm gonna maintain a queue of residual, pat uh, of residual problems, um, a subset of blocks and a number of districts. And uh, so the initial problem, as I indicated, was uh, the uh, entire state and the number of districts. And I'm just gonna build a queue. And if I'm down to the point where there's only one district left, okay, that generates one column for our, um, uh, our uh, uh, ultimate matrix. But otherwise, I'm gonna repeat a repetition number of times, uh, W times. Uh, that I'm gonna choose this splitting factor. And then I'm gonna take the number of seats that I have for that region and split it into um, that many pieces. I'm gonna subdivide the region into that many pieces. And then I'm gonna add each of those elements to the queue. 
Um, and so there'll be randomness used in, in this process in two ways, both as the sort of the number of samples that I draw, the, the repetition factor, and uh, the, the, the splitting factor that uh, occurs. And although I've written uh, the, the region and the size splits in separate lines, in some sense, they're both linked. And in many ways, this is the process, they're, they'll be linked in the following way. So what we're going to do is sample regions, uh, blocks from within the region um, and uh, create centers of regions and their associated size. So in this case, I've highlighted that we've made the random, the choice to, to do a three-way split. We, we sample um, three centers and their associated size, and then we compute a partition. So as follows, and, and then we're going to recurse um, in each side, in this case on the six, and we can split those into two and so forth and down to one. And so this gives you the sense of, of, of the mechanism that's going on, but none of the details. So let me sort of say a little bit more, a little bit away, and there are a number of approaches that we're gonna use. So I'm going to, let's say, select Z centers. The first center we're gonna pick uniformly at random from blocks in uh, the region. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna use a population-based weighted, I would nor we would normally call it K-means, but, 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 uh, but really, for example, one approach will be then to use Lloyd's algorithm in a z-means way where the weights are the population blocks. And I'm gonna fix the first center that I, I, I've used. And, uh, and that's gonna allow me to decompose this, the, the current region into z pieces. And uh, the, the choice of the random seat split, of course, has to in some sense be linked uh, accordingly and will be reflect the, uh, the, the population split, but still in a random way um, that's linked to the region split that, that's, that's gone. So we, we produced this uh, um, ra a random partition, but again, and now coming back to the question that was asked earlier, um, how do I ensure that the regions are actually contiguous well, this is going to be done again by another level of integer program. So the input to this integer program is a region. Um, we have the corresponding centers that we've selected, Z of them. We have a corresponding size that, that, that we want to produce. And now what we want to do is we want a compact um, in a sort of well-formed, a uh, geometric shape of the of the geographic shape of the district output that uh, partitions the, the 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 region's blocks into being associated with each of those centers and this is again done by um, an integer program here the indicator variable xij is to indicate whether a given block j is assigned to one of those specified centers um, so th that's the meaning of the variable xij. And uh, we want to ensure compactness, and that's done by having this kind of dispersion effect of a uh, population weighted, pj is the population, and distance centric of, if I'm thinking about assigning a, a, a block j to a region i, that, that we encapsulate that as well. We, of course, want the every, um, region every block to be assigned to one of the centers. We want that the resulting um, parts of this partition to be population balanced, but within our given tolerance um, and with respect to the number of seats. So, I mean, if I have SI seats, then, then of course, sort of on average, I'm going to want uh, SI times an average P hat um, number of, of people assigned to it. Um, and now getting to the, the, the question there, we're gonna have these um, constraints which are going to enforce that the district are, are contiguous. And this is a sort of standard integer programming model that says that if I look at, um, if, if this variable is set to one, if, if um, 
block J is assigned to center I, then there must be amongst um, all of the neighbors of block J that are closer uh, to uh, um, I than, than J itself, looking at that edge set of that original adjacency graph, that one of those neighbors must also have been selected and assigned to, to I. And that assures us that we have uh, the co contiguity constraints. And this is a formulation introduced in one of the papers I mentioned earlier by Moatra, Johnson, and Nemhauser um, that was a part of the machinery that they used as well. Okay. David, uh, you have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Uh, I see uh, uh, hand raised, but before that, there is a question for Bobby Kleinberg in the chat window. Bobby, would you like to? Oh, uh, the question dates back from quite a few slides when you were saying that the goal was to design diverse regions. And I was wondering if you were at some point going to elaborate on what that term means in this context. So really what I, I mean, I, for that, I'm not going to introduce a formal notion, but I really want to say that there, there should be plans that are, provide, or, I mean, in many ways, a range of distinct options while still being generated by a more compact representation of the, of the number of columns. Okay, so there, I apologize. There is one more question from George. Uh, sure. It might be the right time to ask. Hi, David. Uh, I was just wondering about this alpha in the formulation, which we didn't mention. In yeah, so, so that's sort of a power factor that, uh, that, that it really gives a sense of how much, you know, you know the, 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 the bigger the alpha, the, the, the more the influence of how much the dispersal is, the, you know, because so I, I'm going to sort of get more. I don't know what the opposite word of eccentricity. I'm going to get you know a more centralizing factor. The the bigger that alpha is, and 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 this was tuned just in terms of the the kinds of results that we got. Okay, great. Thanks, George. David, and and, and I'll abuse uh, uh, my ability to unmute myself, and we'll ask a question too. Uh, uh, so your uh, optimization criterion, which you listed on the previous slide. That already encodes your notion of fairness? No, so this is this is only a question of generating columns. So, so this is only a question of having a robust set of plans and to therefore have an, a, a very, an exponentially large ensemble of district plans for the entire state. And so now when we turn to, when we get to the point of thinking about fairness, then we're going to be optimizing fairness with respect to the entire state. So. And, and, I'll, and I'll come to this shortly. Got it, thank you. Okay, so I mean, I've been having this play in the background. This is a depth first search of the, one of the trees that was generated uh, for North Carolina. Uh, so, so we've now you know, outlined uh, a means to uh, um, produce a range of solutions. Um, but of course, we, we need me mechanisms to evaluate them, and, and there, are, there are many ways to think about evaluating um, the kinds of uh, solutions that, 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 we've, that we've posed. And one question, which you know, goes at the district level, which we're sort of ready to think about um, even just now, given what I've shown you to date, sort of before, is to get some sense of, well, how do I measure how compact uh, a, a district is. And there are a number of ways to do this. The, there's sort of a what, what might be called a district centralization me measure, which is I think is a population average weighted distance to the centroid of a district. There's a, another metric known as the Rook measure, which is the ratio of the area of the district to the smallest circumscribing circle. Or given that I have the, 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 the graphical representation and I think about the contiguity with respect to uh, a connected component in the, uh, in the graph, in effect, in the, the dual to the, the, the plane graph of the region, um, we can think about the number of edges in the dual that we need to cut in order to isolate that district. Um, and to give you a sense of sort of this randomized mechanism that I showed into play, um, here are 
the the at least three district uh, of the 50 states um, with respect to um, two of those uh, metrics the on top the uh, edge cut metric and the middle the bottom one the rook metric um, in each case sorted in terms of what the current plan does and uh, one when one sees, you know, really wide discrepancies in terms of uh, what can be achieved and what is achieved um, by the, the approach that we've taken. But sort of the bottom line is that, you know, we're close or better than uh, the sort of stand these two standard metrics than, than, than the existing plans. Um, in doing this there. And of course, the, the gerrymandered states we hope to be much better than. Um, that I'm not cheating on, on, uh, on one metric versus another, um, that, uh, that, that, that now I've replaced the top graph by the centralization metric. But now let me come to fairness, since that was in the, you know, was in the title and, and that's really the, the, the driving message behind our perspective that we're gonna be thinking about fairness as a, what I might call a data-driven model. We're gonna be using historical data to inform an underlying probabilistic model of how do we expect a, a given block to vote. Um, and one way to think about, you know, how, what results from a given state is you might contrast as a, as a function of the uh, vote share the seat share. Um, and uh, there are a number of characteristics of this, 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 this curve. Um, one is often called responsiveness, which is the, the slope of the vote share seat share um, curve. And another aspect that often comes into play is sort of the notion of symmetry, that independent of which party, that if you get Y percent of the vote, that should yield uh, X percent of the seats. And, and, and a well-known notion that, that, that uh, uh, gets used is so-called efficiency gap, um, which uh, can be expressed in terms of exactly this vote, the relationship of the, the responsiveness in the vote share, seat share uh, curve. Um, in many of the traditional formulations that, that have, have been put out, the objective function that in evaluating fairness must be a, a linear function of blocks. By doing things in the way that we have and having explicit variables for districts, this allows our objective function to be in fact a piece, any piecewise linear function of the districts um, uh, itself. Um, and the coefficient can be an arbitrary function of the, of the blocks. And the idea that we want is we wanna minimize the difference between let's say the, the statewide seat share and the vote share. So if I think about on a district by district basis, I think about a random variable nu i, uh, vi of uh, as being uh, uh, the vote share um, in that district. And let's use historical data, let's say in recent elections to model this um, as a, you know, by estimating both the, the mean and, and, and the variance. And of course, then the corresponding uh, random variable of the seat share psi i is just, you know, the probability can be expressed as the probability that the random variable itself is more than a half in terms of what's the, the likelihood then of the, of, that very, of the outcome being skewed accordingly. If I'm thinking about expectation, linearity of expectation allows me to sum over a k-district solution and uh, allows me then to capture for each district um, a, an, an effect on the resulting outcome of being nothing more than the, the mean minus the expression you see here, where this is, of course, just the Gaussian. And so the fact that, I mean, I said it in terms of the statewide the state seat share uh, and the vote share, it need not be exactly that. We're really able to encapsulate any mapping of what the um, district by district uh, uh, share of the votes should, should capture in terms of the seats. 
So, so this allows me to go back to that set partitioning integer program um, and, and, and set up an objective function that if I think about CJ as being the, the, the value of in that district as being the expect, expectation of the ideal seat share versus the minus the seat share, this then is the contribution of, of uh, that district if it were one, that, that column, if it were selected as, as one of the districts. Um, of course, this is a sign quantity. And uh, what I now end up having is minimizing this you know, V-shaped kind of, 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 of event. I don't want to minimize the absolute value because that would be just pushing for one party. I'm really, uh, uh, I don't want to minimize the sign value. I want to minimize the, the absolute value um, with respect to the resulting outcome. Um, this isn't a problem, of course, in terms of solving this as a, as a, as a linear program or correspondingly an integer linear program, because the standard um, uh, trick of introducing an auxiliary variable to capture the absolute value works hand in hand with the minimization. So we again go back to our, our, our uh, set partitioning integer program and, and we can optimize uh, fairness from this point of view doing exactly as you know, we've seen this set partitioning integer program many times before. Um, and of course, this allows us to add many you know, other additional linear constraints that, that, that one might imagine. And, and this opens up a range of different possibilities, just ways in which one might think about uh, uh, enforcing uh, some number of majority minority districts and, and the like. There are a range of, 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 of different kinds of things that be, can, can be captured um, by, by having that flexibility. Um, one thing that perhaps I didn't make clear is that, that we really saw, can, can think of solving the set partitioning problem for every root partition. Once we've separated things at the root, then we end up with, with, with districts that don't mesh together so well. But it allows us to, to, to run this in sort of multiple trials for every root partition um, and, and gives rise to a, a range of, of many fair solutions. Now, coming back to a discussion that, 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 that I guess Dexter posed uh, at the start while people are still joining, I mean, in some sense, unfairness is much easier than, 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 than fairness. That if I just, you know, I, I lose that absolute value in some sense, and I end up with a linear function, and I have no, you know, other constraints, then this is exactly the kind of thing that can be solved by a dynamic program. That you know, we can think about, the, you know, with respect to our probabilistic model at the district level, the expected number of seats um, for each proposed, you know, district at the leaf of of this decomposition tree, and what happens going forward is that. Uh, we, we simply can, over every possible decomposition that we think of, that we generate by our, our W repetitions at each node, look at the one that, that, that does the best, and we can just propagate this up the decomposition tree and can, you know, find the, the, the maximum unfair uh, partition. So, you know, in, in, in that sense, uh, there, uh, you know, that, uh, the, the, the integer programming formulation you know builds us in more flexibility and but but we if we if we only wanted to you know do the hard thing that would that would I mean the the unfair thing that would actually be easier but now I want to just give you a sense of what the results are so so this is again all 50 um, uh, at least three district states um, this is seat share is an increasing function of republicanism. Um, that uh, uh, the the X's denote um, the uh, average seat share um, across the last decades uh, elections according to the uh, current uh, allocation, but. The real message again here, as you you know, this is sort of the, the 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 warning shot that in thinking about the the fairness criterion in this way, there's just a tremendous amount of range even within these well-shaped compact districts in terms of what the expected democratic seat share could be um, nationwide, 
ranging, you know, full 20% uh, range just in terms of that with with a, a large number of seat swap seat swaps um, there and I mean in some sense if you look at which states um, actually are adhering to things that where the expected value for their current plan is um, close to what would be proportionately fair um, that uh, there are very few states that uh, that, that that are that are um, currently uh, so executed. Um, it also, I mean, there are also interesting anomalies. I mean, I mean you know, we live in New York, um, so it's always, you know, they, it's a little shocking to still be told that, you know, in terms of the notion of fairness, the current <coughs> seat plan, which, you know, especially sitting here in Tompkins County, we think is being particularly unfair, um, uh, you know, is 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 not so far off the map, um, but uh, I mean, if you think about a, a, a state that you know, in terms of the original districting, like Pennsylvania, you 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 really do see the 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 reason why the districting um, was as controversial as it was. Um, but uh, maybe I'll move on. So I mean, really, the the uh, the high level view is that you know what we've done is generate a you know we've really just used the, the the tools of modern day integer programming combined with this robust column generation approach <coughs> to to build a, a very rich ensemble of of potential district plans over which we can thereby optimize there, thereby optimize with respect to a number of criteria in particular uh, a, a range of different fairness criteria. Um, it, it actually scales well. So the fact that there can be districts with, you know, states with in the legislative um, partitioning with, with many more districts than, than California, our most populous state has in terms of con congressional districts. So this, this could be used at, at all that scale. Um, and, and it builds into this flexibility. But of course, the fact that, that, that exposing the technology makes it clear that, it, you know, this can be used both in terms of maximizing fairness and minimizing fairness or maximizing unfairness. Um, but, uh, but we hope that the tool could, will be amongst the array of, of, uh, of, 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 of approaches that can be used to help inform the discussion as when the census becomes finalized uh, later this year and, and then gets, gets put up for the use of uh, um, by the state legislatures for, for particular plans. Um, of course, at this moment in time, it doesn't look likely that HR1 will be a thing. It, it indeed is advocating what we believe is the right thing to do, that independent commissions should be uh, uh, empowered to uh, weigh a portfolio of districting plans. Um, and uh, Wes has built a wonderful website, fairmandering.org, which is meant to be the, the political arm uh, of this work in terms of trying to, to um, expose the, the tools that are there and, and, and bring them wider recognition for uh, more general use. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Let's unmute ourselves and the food to thank the speaker. So we do have time for questions. Let's go ahead. So David, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, so th there are many groups that are thinking about different um, solutions for this districting. Um, you have, I think, some technical advantages. Do you have some political advantages in getting your solutions to the home plate? I think this, the unfortunate simple answer is no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that I mean, um, and I'm certainly eager to hear from all of you of, 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 of things that could be done to help promote what I think is really a, a viable technology at scale that, 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 that would enable uh, the, this to become a, an operational tool. 
but 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 yeah, I mean, this is this is the question um, in terms of how do we go from something which which we could put in the hands? I mean, that you know, of of any um, certainly would be great to work with any of the independent commissions to if they would want to 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 have access to the tool. You know, absolutely, um, because we don't believe that there are right answers, but there are these are mechanisms for understanding right possibilities um, and sort of measuring and, and, and uh, calibrating um, the kinds of results that, that, that are possible. Thank you. Thank you. Gabe. Um, yeah, hi, David. Thanks so much for uh, the talk. It's super interesting. Um, I'm, I've been thinking about the redistricting problem more from the MCMC approach, um, where we're trying to sample from the space of districting plans according to some target distribution. Um, and I'm interested if, if you thought about sort of, if you have any sense of where your ensembles sit in the space of, of plans. Um, I don't think it's like uniform or anything, but do you know, like, is it only compact plans according to some definition? Uh, and I'm also interested in how fast um, um, like this might be for sort like small graphs, if you have any stats on that. Um, Wes, you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, so in terms of, in terms of speed, uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, I would say it's comparable to like the Jerry chain software. So you can generate a tree in a few hours um, and obviously, uh, you know, if you want a big tree, you just run it for longer. Uh, but but it's it's the sort of thing that you can run on a laptop overnight. Um, uh, as far as the distribution, uh, I would say, yeah. So so one of the 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 thing that sort of constrains the space of plans the most from our side is the uh, number is the contiguity constraint. So uh, on one of the slides that David introduced uh, of the partition sub problem, uh, you'll notice that all of our plans have to be sort of a subtree of the shortest path tree rooted at a center. Um, and so that does sort of affect the distribution uh, that, that, you're, that we're sampling from. So, so whereas, uh, you know, a, a Markov chain based approach is just a random spanning tree. Uh, this, is, this is a random subtree of a shortest path tree. Thanks so much. Yeah. Octai? So hi, David, nice talk. Uh, I mean, I'm again thinking in terms of, you know, maybe one can do column generation here instead of, you know, generating these candidate districts uh, in advance. So for, for that, uh, one has to figure out what makes a district acceptable. And s s population is one thing. Contiguity of the you know blocks is another thing. Uh, what other th you know considerations do you have for a you know I mean, district to be acceptable? And second question would be what would measure the quality of that district beyond its contribution to the objective function? So the, mean, way you, yeah. the, the most explicit thing is, I I think it to survive any smell test of sanity. Um, it uh, would have to have some notion of compactness um, because otherwise you could really easily imagine very filigreed districts. And I, I think it's hard, hard to, um, I mean, they're both good political, both natural and the word political may have too many negative connotations that, that, that there is a reason for coherence of a district that speaks in favor of compactness as a constraint for um, what what makes an acceptable district. That uh, really, you know, if you you know take the, the 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 four by eight example, if they really just drew it, you know, full width of that state, in some sense that does not feel very natural. And 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 in terms of, you know, maybe going back to. The, the view that, that this should be a representative who represents you know, this group of voters who are in some sense cult culturally aligned, then, then there is 
I think there would be political. I think it would place resistance if you didn't have a notion of compactness that that was just part and parcel of that, because it would just immediately look that it was jerry. You know, the, the, there would be a belief that it was gerrymandered um, in a uh, an explicit way. It, it's also important to consider the composition, right? So one particular district. Uh, it's hard to list all of the factors that that one district might need. Uh, what's more important is the the composition of district. So, you know, if one particular district doesn't have, isn't a majority minority district, that doesn't matter, but we might want a state to have at least one. Daniel. So it's actually related maybe to what Wes just said, but it seems like when you, talk about fairness, it's fundamentally about a global measure of fairness. And um, global measure of fairness may very well imply huge unfairness on a local level. In particular, um, let's cut this district out in a way that uh, it's 70% Democrat and the other 30% of the votes in this district are now basically wasted because they are never, ever, ever gonna win. Um, is there any way of even thinking about fairness on a local level? Oh. I mean, I think the, the natural answer is yes, in that we, I mean, after all, we could just restrict the columns to build, you know, for whatever, you know, if you want to say that there should be some sense that if I'm in a state, which has some, to some extent, the ability to, to be relatively, to maintain district by district equity, one could just introduce that into the constraints of what I take as, as, as acceptable columns. And I mean, this would be an interesting, um, you know, experiment to play is that suppose I, you know, not only want to worry about min, min, min sum, but min max in terms of the terms of what's showing up in the objective function. And, and that would be kind of natural, but there would be thresholds after, you know, below which it's just not feasible. Um, because, because there are kind of, you know, there, there's no way to, you know, handle, let's say, New York State, for example, and, and, and make Manhattan be more balanced than, than, than uh, you would I mean, so, so it's not clear what the right definition is, but it's clear that for, or I think it's pretty natural that with these tools, for any definition that you want to hypothesize, there would be ways of actually implementing it. Eva? Thanks. I was wondering if you have any, rep, any measure of how robust your fair solution is. And I don't know quite what robust could mean here, but you know, there are political shifts, like either yep. the variation increased or the or the, there is minor shift in demographics. And when you declared it's fair, how, how sure are you that with some minor shift it remains fair? Good question. Um, I mean, I mean, we've played with this. Um, and in, in thinking about what the right right sort of definitions might be and whether there would be a, a natural, I mean, in some sense, linear, you know, linearization of a, of a variance term that could be added to the objective um, that, that could come into play, but, but we don't have good answers. Just to piggyback on that question, if you were to say, model a shift of 5%, meaning 5% uh, of voters go from party A to party B. Have you played with um, the outcome of your districting on like in your districting, how those this 5% shift would affect the total seat allocation? As in like, would it be a 5% shift or would it be a 30% shift? So that's a good question. We haven't played with it. At least I haven't had a discussion with Wes whether he Wes has played with it. But Wes always does things that in anticipation of, of, of things that I haven't thought of yet. So maybe Wes has a different answer. Uh, so not that direct question, but at least with the with respect to robustness. I mean, we we do take into account the variance of past elections. So 
at, at the very least of the past 10 years, right? Whatever variance is is within that, we, we project that forward. So it's not the case that if a district is, you know, 50.1, we declare that a victory, right? That, that, that really only counts for 50% of a seat. Um, so it, it, it's usually about, you know, 5% to, to, for us to give a seat you know, probability of victory close to one. Bob? Uh, following up on Shane's question, uh, the person connected to Cornell, who I think would be most interesting to talk to about this is, is Steve Israel. Have you been in touch with him? No, I haven't. In fact, so, do you, you know who he is? No, I don't actually. Okay. So Steve Israel was a Democratic member of Congress from Queens for close to two decades, I think, and was very prominent in the Democratic caucus and ran the DCCC uh, and was very highly regarded in that. And he, um, he retired from the House and works for Cornell in New York, okay. run a, a politics and global policy institute. Um, he occasionally comes to Ithaca for events. And um, I, I would think uh, in terms of reaching to the other side, uh, he would be a very interesting person to try and, and uh, run this past. Super. Well, I think this might be the time for all of us to thank the speaker again. And if people want to stick around afterwards to ask more questions, please do. Thank you. So thank you, David. Thank you, everyone.